Hey, Mid-Cities, I am so excited for us today. We have Aaron Morolas in the house with us today. And what you may not realize is Aaron is a son of this house. He grew up at Mid-Cities, and I remember taking him to our Extreme Kids Camp when he was an elementary student. Uh, Aaron is in our church planning residency program right now. And here in a few years, he and his beautiful wife, Issa, are going to plant a church. Uh, can you give Aaron Morolas a big, warm Mid-Cities welcome? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. So glad you're in the room today. I want to welcome everyone here and also want to welcome everyone that's watching online as well. So glad that you've tuned in. And I'm excited to be here with all of you. It's an honor to be able to share with you guys today. And I'm so thankful uh, to be on this stage. And I want to just take a second and introduce myself. Of course, my name is Aaron, but I also want to introduce my beautiful wife, uh, Isabella. I'm going to show a little picture here. Yep, that's my wife. We've been married for a few months. So if you've not seen us or you see us around, come say hi. We would love to get to know you, love to shake your hand, love to just get to talk to you. She's serving with some babies right now. So that's what she's doing. But so thankful for her. And I also want to take a moment before we jump in today and just honor and just thank our pastor. Um, we have such an incredible pastor, Pastor Daniel and Kayla. They do so many incredible things for our community, for our church. And they've been my pastor for all 26 years of my life. I'm so thankful for them. They've been with us and my family through the ups and downs of our lives. And uh, I'm just so incredibly thankful for the opportunity they've given us to also go and plant a church. And so pray for us as we go off to eventually plant a church here soon. Um, and maybe you will come with us. It would be a lot of fun. So pray about that as well. Uh, but today uh, we have jumped into the Christmas season. Um, who here is excited about Christmas? Anybody excited about Christmas? Yeah, there we go. Uh, we, you know, I feel like the week after Thanksgiving is the official Christmas time. Uh, some of you started in October, uh, but for us normal people, we start right about this time. And so trees are up, uh, Christmas songs are in the air, there's shopping to do, there's meals to cook, there's all sorts of things happening. And it's like we have decided we will just put every social gathering in the next 25 days, right? I mean, your calendars are full of crazy things, uh, get togethers, work events, all the stuff. And so I hope you enjoy the holidays. And oftentimes when you come to church uh, during the holidays, you'll hear maybe a Christmas story, right? Uh, maybe we'll hear about Joseph. Uh, maybe we'll hear about Mary, uh, the birth of Jesus. Maybe we'll hear about the wise men. Um, well, today is just not that day. I'm sorry. Uh, we're not going to talk about the wise men. Um, today I want to jump into a piece of scripture uh, with a different group of characters that I'm going to call today the unwise men, the unwise men. This isn't a Christmas story, just a little uh, partnership of two guys that we find in Scripture in Acts chapter 4 that I would say are the unwise men in the Bible. So we're going to be in that. And I want to set the scene for you today as we jump into talking about the unwise men. Um, we're going to be talking about Peter and John in Acts 4. But a few chapters before, here's what's happening. The early church is on the rise. Um, people are giving their lives to Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, we have this day of Pentecost that happens where people are, are filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, many people begin to profess that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of their life. And the church is born. There's leaders that are starting to come out. There's uh, what we'd call maybe elders or pastors, apostles are starting to form. And this is a big deal um, because there, who here knows when there's something good that's happening, there's always what we call haters, right? There's always someone to hate. There's always someone to come and, and not be happy or excited about it. Always someone that uh, would not like what's happening. And this <laughs> group of people today, uh, that's in this uh, moment, Acts chapter 4, are what we call the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees are a religious group. Um, they're kind of a political group as well. Uh, they're usually wealthier people. They have a lot of power. This is the group, uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees are the group that have uh, plotted together to put Jesus on the cross. Uh, so they got a little weight behind them, some authority behind them. Um, the Sadducees, what was interesting about them, they did not believe in the resurrection. 
Uh, so obviously they did not believe in Jesus dying and being resurrected. Uh, the Sadducees also did not believe in the afterlife. Uh, so they definitely didn't believe in this idea of heaven or that there could be a way to get to heaven. Um, and so when the early church begins to rise up and begin to uh, do all of these great things and miracles start happening and people start professing Jesus and people start talking about Jesus being resurrected, um, they, they're not excited about this. Uh, they are the haters in the room. They're, they're wanting to close down this talk of Jesus. And we catch up in the story of Peter and John just performed a miracle um, through the power of God and healed a crippled man. He couldn't walk and now he can walk and he begins to tell people that it was through Jesus that he was healed. So this is the scenario we find ourselves in Acts chapter four and, uh, and here we're gonna dive in to see how the Sadducees handle these unwise men. Let's read together in Acts chapter four, verse one. It says this, and as they were speaking to people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that Jesus is the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word had already believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000 that gave their lives to Jesus. Let's skip down to verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst of all the people, they were inquired and they asked them this question, by what power or by what name did you heal this man? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, rulers of people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning the good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of Israel that the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man is standing before you healed and well. Woo, Peter, he is letting them have it. He is telling them, what's up? He's like, if you had any question about who did this miracle, let me tell you, it's Jesus. Whew. And he keeps going, verse 12. Then he also says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And lastly, the Sadducees look at them and he says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they had, were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. I want to ask a question today. This is our big question that I want us to be thinking about as we dive into the word today. What is stopping me from doing great things for God? What is stopping me to do great things for God? Would you pray with me? God, we love you. We thank you for your word today. Would you speak to us? Would you challenge us? Would you inspire us? God, would you help us get closer to you as we dive into your word today? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we're looking at this piece of scripture and the person that comes clear to be the main character is our friend Peter, right? Oh, Peter, if you've, you spend time in the word, you know Peter is uh, kind of crazy. Peter lives on the edge. And in many of my relationships in my life, I would probably say um, I am the Peter in most of my relationships. Uh, I'm usually the person that might say something to get us in trouble. I'm, I'm usually maybe the loud person, uh, the person that might say something that you, I regret later, right? But there are a few relationships I have in my life, just a few, where I am the John and someone else is the Peter. Someone else is that loud friend uh, who here has a friend that maybe talks a little too much, maybe uh, has a bigger bark than, than they are, the size they are, right? Who has any friends that might get you in trouble? Anybody got some friends like that, right? I think we all have some friends like that. And one of my closest friends that I grew up with, his name, we call him Bug. 
B-U-G-G. Now his last name is Bug, and with a last name like that, how could we not call you Bug? So all of our friends, we call him Bug. His first name is Cameron. And Cameron reminds me a lot of like Peter. Cameron is the type of guy where we'd be walking down the hall and he would say something to someone much larger than us. And I'd be like, Cameron, we are, we, you're going to get us killed, okay? Like he is the type of person that would open his mouth, say some things that you just wish he wouldn't say, do some things you wish he wouldn't do, and you love him, but you're also like, you're going you're gonna to get us killed, bro. Like just stop talking. I remember one time we went to a movie together and uh, we had some friends with us and we were in high school and uh, we were sitting and then a, a large man walks into the movie theater and sits right in front of us. And, you know, we're typical high school students, so we're just talking, laughing, making jokes. And the man looks up, stands up, looks at us and says, basically in a very kind way, uh, you're going to stop talking now. And, uh, and so at that point, uh, me and Cameron, uh, I looked at Cameron, I said, well, I'm just going to eat my popcorn. I'm going to save my life. I'm not going to say anything. Like, we're good. I, like, no issues. We don't need any issues. We're good. And then I look to the right and I see my friend Cameron. And Cameron, you can just see the words are about to come out of his mouth. And you're just thinking, and I'm thinking in my head, like, I, you are going to get us killed. And so I gave him the friendly nudge, you know, like, bro, if you say anything, I will kill you. Because if, because he will kill us, right? And so I gave him the little nudge and told him, like, bro, you better not say anything. And thankfully, for the first time ever, he listened. He didn't say anything. And that is why I'm here today. Uh, to talk to you today. And so I'm so thankful for Cameron, but, um, but Cameron reminds me a lot of this guy, Peter. Uh, just kind of on the edge, talking out loud, you know, maybe a little noxious. And, you know, it was interesting with Peter because this is a situation where Peter could have just stayed quiet. This was a really good time for Peter to just be like, hey, bro, if you don't say anything, maybe we get out of this alive. I mean, think about it. These are the people that just sent Jesus to the cross. And and in this moment, I bet John is looking at Peter like, what are you doing? Like, if you just stay quiet, we get through. Maybe we live. Maybe we, we last another day, right? But Peter was having none of this. All of a sudden, Peter gets this boldness about him. And he begins to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah. And he begins to proclaim that Jesus is the one who heals. And he begins to proclaim that the only person we can be saved by is through Jesus. This boldness comes in Peter's life. It's an incredible moment. But what made Peter so bold? What got him to do this? What what caused him to be so bold in this moment? I think there's a few things we can learn from these unwise men. The first thing that I think we can learn from Peter and John is this, is they were common men with an uncommon spirit. They were common men with an uncommon spirit. What I noticed in Acts chapter 4, it talks about how Peter was then filled up with the Holy Spirit. And if you read the Bible, you know that in Acts chapter 2, Peter was there and he was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And I think this is a good reminder for us today that the Holy Spirit fills us up again and again and again. That when we are weak, when we are broken, when we are in need, when we are empty, uh, the Holy Spirit is faithful to come upon us and fill us again and again and again. And this is how good our God is, is that in moments when we are scared, in moments where we might be afraid, in moments when we are not naturally bold or we would not be the person to speak up, it is in these moments that the Holy Spirit comes and he fills us up so we can do what God has called us to do. And who here knows that we need the Holy Spirit to come. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us up again and again and again. And oftentimes... We'll tell ourselves, man, I don't, maybe I shouldn't share the gospel. Maybe I shouldn't tell my friends about Jesus. Maybe I shouldn't bring up religion during the holiday season and talk about Jesus and what he's done for life because I don't want to mess up the status quo. 
I don't want to, when I bring this up, maybe it might be awkward. Maybe it might be weird. I don't know if my friend will receive it. I don't know if my family member will receive it. I don't know if this person, what what are they going to think of me if I bring up Jesus? You know, oftentimes the enemy will tell us this. The enemy will always say, just stay quiet. It won't matter anyways. Oh, just stay quiet. It won't matter anyways. That person won't come to church anyways. They're not going to give their life to Jesus anyways. Just, just stay quiet. It won't matter anyways. But the Spirit tells us this. You can't stay quiet. It's not about you anyways. And this is the Spirit that Peter has come to realize. That it's not about him anyways. Even though his life is on the line, even though he's in this moment where he could literally die for his faith, he's come to the conclusion that this isn't about me, it's about others knowing who Christ is. It's about others knowing the power of Jesus. It's about others knowing for a fact that only Jesus can heal and save. And he's come to this conclusion through the Holy Spirit, it's not about me, it's about them. And I wonder today, if we could live with this type of boldness. You see, the first lie that Peter could have believed is this. I can't do this. I'm just a nobody. I can't do anything great for the kingdom of God. I'm just a fisherman. I'm just a nobody. Uh, And maybe some of us have believed this lie as well, this idea that I can't do anything great for God. I'm just a teacher. I'm just an oil field worker. I'm just, you know, I just work on, I'm just a safety guy. I'm just a company man. I can't do anything great for the kingdom of God. I'm just an accountant or a stay-at-home mom. How often have we believed this lie? I can't do anything great for the kingdom of God. I'm just, I'm just a nobody. I'm not the pastor. I'm not the preacher. I'm not the person on stage. I'm just an everyday, average, common person. I wonder how many of us today are believing this lie as well. But I want to tell you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul reminds us that we are not just some common people. It says this, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on our behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Can I tell you today, stay at home mom, accountant, teacher, coach, wherever you are today. Can I tell you today, you are a representative for Christ. You're a representative in our school system. You're a representative at that Starbucks you work at. You're a representative in the house that you manage. You are a representative of Christ if you are in Christ Jesus. And God wants to use you to do something great in the people around you. So let me ask you this question again. What's stopping you from doing something great in the kingdom of God? You might be a common person, but can I tell you, there is nothing common about the living God that's in you. You might be just an everyday person. But there is nothing common about the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. And through His Spirit, He can do something great in you. The second thing that I look at Peter and John in this story, the second clue that I get that they help us with these unwise men is they were uneducated. They were not inexperienced. They may have been uneducated. They may have not been the sharpest tools in the shed. There there was a gap between these men and the Sadducees that were in front of them. These Sadducees were educated. They were biblically trained. They knew the Torah. They knew the Bible. They they had higher education than these men. But I loved what verse 13 said. It said that they recognized that these men had been with Jesus. So powerful that that they look at their lives and they're like, yeah, they're not very smart. But they know God. They don't have all the answers. But they know Jesus. No doubt they've been with the Savior. I wonder if the same would be true about your life. I wonder if the same would be true about our lives today. When people look at us, when it's all said and done, will people look at your life and say, man, all I know is this, John knew Jesus. Grace 
knew God. Khalil followed the Lord. I wonder if that will be what people say about us. You know, we live in a world where education is pretty much everywhere. You can educate yourself of just about everything on YouTube or any other places. Higher education is more and more common today. And when I look at uh, someone that I might maybe hire or bring on, um, here's what I'm looking at. Of course, education matters, and many people have a great education. I would encourage you, keep, if you have the opportunity, to continue to educate yourself, great. But here's what I'm also looking at. What has this person done? What tools do they have? What skills do they have? What experience do they have, right? We all want to know, what, what do they do that's so good, that's so great? Who have they done it with? How long have they done it? Experience matters, right? We all care about experience. And in this moment, Peter had the experience of a lifetime, of three years of following Jesus. You see, the enemy will always tell us, you don't know enough. But the spirit will always say, I'll use what you do know. Oftentimes, we will convince ourselves of this lie that I just don't know. I don't know enough about the Bible. I, I, I don't know enough about these scriptures. I haven't gone to church long enough. You, you give all the reasons. I just don't know enough to tell people about Christ. I don't have all the answers. What are they to ask something that I don't have the answer to, right? And, and we'll, all of a sudden, we'll make this the excuse to why I'm not going to share my faith. The lie that Peter could have believed that day was I can't do this, I don't have all the answers. I can't do anything great for God, I don't know all the stuff. I don't know the whole book, but can I just tell you today, God is not looking at you to have all the answers. God is not worried about whether you can win every theological debate. God isn't worried about if you went to seminary or Bible college, God wants to use you with your yes. I think this, if we speak, God will move. If we just open up our mouth, God will show up. If we just share our testimony and we're bold enough like Peter to do what he did, just to declare that Jesus is the Lord and the Savior of our life, I promise you God will show up just like he did for Peter. And oftentimes we think, I don't know enough and I don't have this answer, I don't have that. And what if they ask me this? then I'll just fall short. And it reminds me of people in my life, these last 26 years as I've served and been a part of this church, I look back and at a young age, I knew I wanted to be a pastor. I mean, when I was a kid, when I was nine or 10 years old, I knew I wanted to be in ministry. But do you know who helped disciple me? Yes, we have great pastors here that help and encourage me. And I got to sit under Pastor Daniel's teaching. It was incredible. Yes, all that. But you know who really did the hard work of telling me about Christ and loving me and encouraging me? It was people like Les McCree, who serves in our children's ministry and has for at least the last 20 years and has faithfully taught kids about Jesus year in and year out, him and his wife. And let me tell you, they're not biblically trained, but they've said yes. And it was the high school you know, leaders that came and hung out with me and took me to lunch and, and invested in me and, and told me stories about the Bible and opened up the Bible with me. And I don't know if they knew even more than I did, but they just showed up and just prayed with me and loved me and cared for me and just showed up every Wednesday night. It was their yes that made such an impact. They weren't worried about if they knew every question. They weren't worried if they had all the answers. They just showed up and God moved in their lives. And maybe, just maybe, I'm here today to encourage some of you. It's time to get up. It's time to get in the game. It's time to get into the student ministry, the high school ministry, the middle school ministry, the kids ministry. Hold those babies. God can use you. And he wants to. And he wants to. You don't have to have all the answers. You just need to know who is the answer. He'll use it. So some of you might be thinking, okay, Aaron, I hear you. I hear you. I'm a common guy, common girl. I don't have to know all the answers. I don't have to be educated. Great, great, check, check. I got those. And then some of you might be thinking this thought. There's one more thing. 
there's one more thing that keeps me out of this Jesus thing. There's one more thing that, that holds me back from really doing something great for God's kingdom. And that thing is what nobody knows about. My past. Or maybe my present that I'm in right now. It's that sin. It's that brokenness that I keep going back to. It's that, that thing that I did 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 15 minutes ago that no one knows about. So, so you're telling me, Aaron, I hear you. I want to do something great for God, but I don't know if I can. I don't know if God could use me. I don't know if God can use someone who's messed up like me. Well, I'm glad that you're in that boat because our friend Peter was in the same boat. See, Peter and these unwise men, they went from denying men to declaring men. They went from denying men to declaring men. And some of you are saying, okay, what are you saying here, Aaron? Because here, if you don't know the story of Peter, it's a good one. It's a one of him messing up, making mistakes, falling short, having his own shortcomings. In Luke chapter 22, we see a different side of Peter. It's not the Acts chapter four Peter. It's not the bold Peter. It's not him filled with the Holy Spirit doing all these great things, him on the mountaintop. No, 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 this, this Luke 22, he's in the valley and he's broken and he's just turned his back on Jesus. And he's done the very thing he said he wouldn't do. He's denied the son of God. Not just once, not just twice, but for the third time, he denies that he even knows Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus and him locked eyes and he left and he left the cross and he began to weep bitterly. He began to cry because he knew what he had done. He knew he messed up. There was no doubt that Peter had failed. He denied his, knowing his best friend. He denied even knowing that he was even around Jesus. And to think about, he looked at his friend on the cross while he was dying for him and said, nah, I don't know, you got the wrong guy, not me. Could you imagine the guilt and the shame he must have felt as he watched Jesus die on the cross? This moment where he is at the lowest of his low. And yet just chapters later in scripture, we see a whole different Peter. Just a few weeks later, we see a whole different Peter that's just up there declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. We see a Peter who's not just denying, he's declaring, yeah, I know that Jesus. He's my Jesus. He's my Savior. All of a sudden, a complete 180 Peter. How did he get to this moment? He got to this moment because church, in the kingdom of God, we don't have cancel culture. In the kingdom of God, we don't cancel people when they made a mistake. We don't cancel people when they've made two or three or five big mistakes. We don't cancel people. We recall people. We repurpose people. We get them on a new mission. We, we have them come to Jesus. We pick people back up. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may have fallen off the cliff, but we're going to pick you back up. We're not a cancel culture we're a get back up culture. And so maybe you've fallen short. Maybe you have made mistakes. Maybe you have a past and you're thinking, Aaron, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. You don't know the business I've been in. You don't know the, the, all the crazy stuff. Can I just tell you today, if he did it for Peter, he can do it for you. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. If he's done it for all of our pastors, all of our leaders, he can do it for you. And he wants to. God wants to to change your direction. The third and final lie Peter could have believed was I can't do this. God can't use me. 
God can't use a mess up like me. And this is proof positive that this is a lie from the enemy. God can and will use us. The enemy will always look at us and say this, look at what you've done. But Jesus says, look what I've done. The enemy will always look at you and say, look what you've done. Look what you did 10 years ago. Look what you did to your family. Look what you did in that situation. Look, that God can't use you. You've messed up too much. I mean, God will often and always look at you and say, no, 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 it's not about what you've done. It is all about what I have done for you. And because what I have done for you changes who you are, I can use you. Because what I've done finishes it all. I want to read you one last scripture today in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's one of my favorite pieces of scripture. It says this, Paul is talking about his sin. He's talking about his mistakes. He's talking about how he is weak. And here's what he says. But he, God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Can I tell you today, Christ's grace is sufficient for you. That word sufficient means just the right amount. God has just the right amount of grace for you today. I wonder this, what lies have you been believing? I'm talking to everyone in the room today. What lie have you been believing about yourself? Is it this lie that God can't use me? I'm just an ordinary person. Just, I'm just, I'm just go to my eight to five. I just do my average stuff. God can't use me. Is it the lie that I don't know enough? I don't have all the answers? Or is it the lie that God can't use a mess up like me? Can I tell you today, stop believing the lies. And start believing the truth that God not just can use you, he wants to use you. He wants to use you in your workplace. He wants to use you in your family. I mean, we just saw families coming to Christ, being baptized, saying yes to Jesus. And it only happens when we say, you know what? I'm tired of believing the lie. So I want to ask you again, what's stopping you from doing something great for the kingdom of God? Will you stand with me today? And as, I, as we stand today with our prayer team, will you come up as we close? Someone, you came here today and you needed to hear that God's grace is enough for you. Some of you today have been on the sidelines and you haven't been doing what God's called you to do because you've allowed guilt and shame to hold you back. Can I tell you no more? God wants to use you today. So as we leave today, as we close this time, I wanna ask you this last question. Maybe it goes on the screen, here you go. What great thing will you do for God today? I wanna leave you not just with a good message and maybe you feel good and you leave church today. No, 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 I want to encourage you today. God's calling you today to call that person. Today to set up that lunch appointment. Today to reconcile or maybe tell someone you're sorry or ask forgiveness or talk to your wife or do whatever you need to do. Today is the day. God's saying you don't have to believe in those lies anymore today. God wants to do something great through you for the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? Lord, help us do something great for your kingdom. We can learn a lot from these unwise, uneducated men. We can learn, God, that you can use us even if we don't have all the answers. 
We can learn, God, that you want to use us even in our common everyday work because we have an uncommon spirit that lives in us. And we can learn, God, that it is your grace that changes us. And because of your grace, I don't have to live in shame. I don't have to hold my head down. I can come to Jesus with my head up and say, God, use me, I'm ready. I'm ready to be used by you, Jesus. So today, God, would we be the unwise men in our community? Would we be the unwise men for Midland, Texas, for Odessa, Texas, for Andrews, Texas, for Crane, Texas, God, so that we can make an impact for the kingdom of God? Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.